morning, everyone. And uh, I'm uh, happy to be here tonight from Colorado today, and uh, where we have our headquarters in uh, Colorado Springs, the headquarters of the uh, U.S. Olympic Committee. And um, really a great honor to be able to come and speak to you a little bit about our technology and a little bit about the Olympic movement. You know, one thing I can tell you is that uh, in our country, the Olympic movement's a little bit unique. We don't have government funding. We are essentially a, a country that basically gets behind its Olympians and Paralympians as individuals, as corporations, um, and make sure that they have the resources they need um, outside of the government, which is completely unusual in the world. And, uh, you know, you have to be a little scrappier, you have to be a little smarter, and technology actually plays into that um, pretty well, as, we, as we've found out. Um, so the, uh, this is a little bit of our structure. Um, first of all, our mission, sustained competitive excellence. We're really focused on the very best athletes, trying to figure out how to send athletes from the United States out to compete with the rest of the world and make sure that they have everything they need to prepare properly so that they can be everything they can be. And, you know, you look at the end of the broadcast every night for the Olympic Games and they have, you know, the little medal table and everybody's, you know, how was Team USA doing? And I look at that and I say that's a reflection of whether my team has done a good job of actually giving the resources to the athletes so that they can do what they're capable of because they are completely capable as individuals and as teams of being the best in the world, but we've got to do our part to make sure that they have resources. So as the chief of sport performance, um, my responsibility is really to take the resources that we have as an organization and deploy them in a way that has maximum impact on the outcomes for athletes. And so everything from um, sports medicine and sports science to the way that we operate our training centers, we have three training centers. One is in, uh, in Colorado Springs, which is kind of the, the biggest one we have. We have a training center in Chula Vista, which is a, actually a training site that we, we have a, a private, uh, private partnership with. And one in Lake Placid, New York, where we do a lot of winter sport work because of the Lake Placid Games in 1980. Um, and the idea is, is that in every one of these areas is to really figure out how do you, how do you make sure that every dollar we spend, every ounce of energy that someone um, um, deploys is used in a constructive way to help athletes. Because it's really hard, you know, I mean, it's, it's hard to be best in the world, and it's hard to make sure that uh, you're not wasting resources. And we have a really important stewardship and fiduciary relation, uh, responsibility to make sure that we do that right. All right. So one of the things that uh, I want to kind of start the presentation off with is that Every member of my team, and I have 350 people on my team, everybody that, you know, from the people that operate the training centers and cook meals and nutrition and make sure the dorms are set and make sure the venues are set, all the way to science and medicine people, to some administrators who, who uh, manage all the grants. Um, we all have three common goals. And we call them key job responsibilities. And it's really been good because this was a, something I implemented a few years ago. It said, look, we're not going to have a bunch of, you know, everybody's not going to have different goals and different key, key job responsibilities. You're going to have two goals. One of them is going to be the medal count in the winter games. One of them is going to be the medal count in the summer games. When we don't have a winter games or summer games, it's basically world championship medals. So we focus on output. And the other is, is that we're going to all play into these three key job responsibilities. Because if we all focus our resources in these ways, we don't make any mistakes and nobody gets off track. Nobody starts picking up their own pet projects. And these are things we can focus our resources on to measure. So a healthy... A uh, healthy team is number one. We have the best athletes in the world, but if they're injured or sick, they don't make it onto the field to play. And so ultimately, making sure that we do everything we possibly can to keep them injury-free and keep them healthy is number one. Number two is really to make sure that we are focusing our infrastructure on exactly what the, co what the athletes need. So when I get into technology and talk about technology, I'm not talking about research. I'm not talking about theory. I'm talking about application. Because anything we do with technology has to be applied to the athletes, and the athletes have to be able to use it in a constructive way to get better. And it's really important, you know, that's, a, that's one of the kind of core concepts for me, because ultimately, if the athletes can't use it, it's not worth much in my world, and it's not worth much in their world. So if we're extending re resources on research that doesn't lead to outcomes for athletes, um, I think that's better left with the with the universities and with academia, and not so much with the U.S. Olympic Committee. So one of the big things for us is to make sure that we're focused on that. And then, and then the third one is, is that we are targeted on the right athletes. We've got to make sure that we understand who our best athletes in every sport and every discipline are. So if you look across it, you know, there are uh, 31 national governing bodies in the summer sports, eight national governing bodies in the winter sports. 
In each of those national governing bodies, you have disciplines, and under those, you have events. So as an example, there's 330 events coming up in the Winter Games. So there's a, there's a lot of events to pay attention to and a lot of athletes to pay attention to. So the idea is, is that in each and every one of those disciplines, in each and every one of those events, you make sure you're focused on the right athletes and you have to use data uh, to get that done. When we uh, constructed our um, allocation process and we started looking at things that we wanted to measure, uh, we broke it down into these five basic areas. One is we working with the right athletes. Two is, do we have the right coaches? So you can have a fantastic athlete, but if they're getting coached poorly, if they're, if they're not being, their program isn't being individualized, if they don't have the experience of helping people win internationally, then we're failing in terms of actually helping the athletes. Do they understand what sorts of training environment is necessary to win? How much, uh, how much detail are they willing to put into each individual program? You know, uh, it was really interesting. When I, I came from the ski and snowboard was my background. And I was a cross country skier at the University of Colorado. And I kind of worked my way up through the system and I got to the US ski team and I really learned and knew about individualization. When I came over to the, uh, to the US Olympic Committee, I started working with some sports that treated everybody the same way. You know, if you had a world champion here and a rookie here, they both had the same program. They were both going to the same practices and training in the same way. Doesn't work. That's not the way you do it. And so one of the things that I've instilled and really focused on is making sure that we have coaches that understand how to individualize training, how to measure that training, and how to make sure that it's appropriate and specific for the individual athletes. Um, are we going to the right competitions? Are we using the competition program effectively so that we're not putting people in over their heads where they fail all the time and all they do is learn to lose? But at the same time, are we making sure that when we they give them enough challenge that they learn how to win? And ultimately, the way you manage each individual athlete in that is, is really important. And then leadership. Are we leading in a good way? Are we communicating in a good way? Are we, we being good stewards? And so uh, in each of these different areas, we said, OK, let's start figuring out how we're going to use technology to measure and to implement, um, really focused on training and competitions. I'm going to start off by talking about one of the, the initiatives that we um, put in place four years ago. So again, when I started, a lot of the decision making was subjective. You know, the coach would walk in and they'd say, you know, this kid's got potential. We need to put resources behind him. And I go, okay, what does potential mean? And you know, over and over and over again, I'd hear that and no one could answer the question. And that's not to say that coaches don't have a lot of insight, but they need data to combine with that insight in order to be best in the world. And so we, uh, we invested in a uh, pretty significant database. And so we now uh, download information about world championships, world cups, grand prix, and all the top level events from every sport, in every discipline, every day. And we have about 50 million lines of data in our database right now that basically gives us direction on how people are performing. So the data in and of itself, you know, it's massive. But the thing we did is we said, okay, how do you use that in such a way so that you know where the performance band is um, so that you can judge where athletes are in relationship to medal expectancy? So we, uh, we worked with a couple of professors from different universities and we developed an algorithm which essentially predicts medal expectancy. It essentially says, if you're within this metal band right here, there's a high likelihood that you'll, um, you're in contention to win a medal or to be you know, close to the podium at World Championships and Olympic Games and Paralympic Games. And we did that for every sport and every discipline. Now, for swimming, track and field, you know, the kind of the time, distance sports, weight sports, weightlifting, you know, those are, those are pretty easy. But when you get into team sports, or you get into combat sports, or you get into judge sports, it becomes a lot more difficult. So what we did there is we said, okay, let's, uh, let's basically use ELO. Let's take the, the, uh, the system that was developed for chess, which said, look, if you have a multi-competitor system where people don't play each other, how do you rank against each other? How do you measure? If I never play you in chess, and you never play me, how do I know where I stand in relationship to how good you are versus how good I am? We took that system, was developed in chess and we modified it so that we could essentially put teams that never played against each other, wrestlers that never wrestled against each other, boxers that never boxed against each other, gymnasts who were never in the same competition all at the same time in a situation where we could evaluate where they were in relationship to each other using an algorithm that was developed through this ELO system, through, through the, the chess system. 
So now, you know, and it was really interesting. So the first time I went to wrestling with this, I said, you know, I got a data system for you. They're like, you don't know our sport. I don't know what you think. You skiers, you know, what do you know about wrestling? Now I cannot get them away from it because what it's done is it's given them a tool to communicate with their athletes. Because instead of the coach sort of saying, you know, I don't think you're going to make it, the first thing the athlete says is, you don't like me. <laughs> instead, they're able to go, look, here's where you stand in a relationship with the rest of the world. And if we don't make changes in your training program and you don't kind of make some progress here, you know, you should really think about what your future is in the sport. It's a much more honest conversation and it's a data-driven conversation. And it's been really helpful. So now wrestling basically embraces this as one of their tools to communicate with their athletes so their athletes understand where they rank in the world, even though they don't get to wrestle every single person in their weight class. And it's super helpful. Rugby, another great one. So last year, uh, or two years ago, leading into the Rio games, um, our women's team was looking really pretty good, but our men's team was way back. You know, they were 8th, ninth, 10th in the world, but when you looked at their ELO ratings, they were a long way from the midpoint and a really long way from the top. So we went to them and said, look, at this stage of the game, we're not going to fund you. Because ultimately, if our principles guide us to helping the very best athletes win medals, you're not, your teams aren't in, the, aren't in the hunt. So how are you going to get in the hunt? So they sat down and had some really difficult decisions and, and some difficult conversations. They changed with their coaching staff, so it kind of goes back to that coaching pillar. They reworked their athlete selection system so that they started getting better athletes and circulating athletes more frequently through and measuring them uh, from the standpoint of their performance characteristics. And quickly, we started to see some progress. Within a year, they went from you know seventh, eighth to fourth. And while they didn't meddle at the games, you could see a lot of progress. And as they made that progress, they started to close the gaps with the very best coaches, with the very best teams in the world. And at that point, when we got involved, we started basically putting some resources into them. So it's a really good tool. Data, this data, as it's applied like this, is, is really a good tool. So that was number one, and, and this is an ongoing process. We're probably one of the only countries in the world that actually does it like this. A lot of people download a lot of this data that we have, but nobody uses it in a system like we use it. And nobody applies it to the high performance allocations of resources the way we apply it. And that's made it, I think, a lot more effective and a lot more transparent for the, for the, for the, co for the coaches and for the athletes. Um, so first of all, full integration of technology and innovation in all aspects of high performance. We're looking at how do we figure it out in every single one of those, uh, those areas, those five major areas I was talking about, how do you use, how do you use technology. So the first one was uh, elite health monitoring system. So if you go back and you remember the KJRs, the key job responsibilities, number one was 100% healthy team, right? So how do you get to that? There is no system that's commercially available that would allow us to actually monitor athletes' health. So the first thing we did is we went to GE, which is one of the sponsors of the International Olympic Committee and one of the sponsors of the U.S. Olympic Committee. And so we want to use your electronic health records to record all information on all of our athletes. So we started to basically um, enter information about each and every one of our athletes that wanted to participate, it wasn't a requirement, totally voluntary, into the system so that we could start to run analytics on it and start to understand trends in health and, in, in health and wellness. Um, but in order to collect the data, all we were really getting is when someone went and saw their physician or someone did like an elite athlete health profile, which is a, a performance assessment, everything from blood to um, muscle alignment, bone alignment, um, cardiovascular health, muscle health, muscle strength, muscle balance, that all would go into the, to the general electric system, this GE system. But we had no way to collect information on a daily basis. So a couple of my staff got together and said we then developed an application where essentially they pushed it out. We have about 500 athletes using it right now. It started this year. And each and every day they go through and answer a simple set of questions about how they feel, about how they performed, about just what their state of mind and physical state is and what their training was for the day. And one of the things you had to do is you had to make it really simple because I think maybe all you are all aware of, you know, all the gadgets and whatnot that are out there to monitor health. But the fact of the matter is, is that A, a lot of them aren't accurate enough for us, and B is they ask too many questions or they don't give you the right information. So this gave us the right information. 
So one of the things we've been able to do through this, this application is start to collect information and look at trends. And what we found is we can predict when someone's going to start getting sick or when they potentially could get injured. And that is huge because if you can start to see certain trends in their, in their physiology and in their, um, in their training and how they're feeling about their training, how they're sleeping, you can, and you can basically see that, you know what, if we don't back off right now, someone's going to get either really sick or really injured. It's a huge tool for us. And it's not complicated. I mean, it's a, it's a lot of data, but doing the analytics on the data and looking for certain trends, because what happened was is we started to collect the information. We collected some information when people did get sick and did get injured and correlated that with their elite athlete health profiles and started to understand the assessment, the individual assessment, full body, full, you know, complete with what was going on on a daily basis. And I'm, I'm really pretty excited about this because I think this is a unique tool in the world right now. Everybody's trying to do it, but we're being, we're able to do it. But it requires two, two really important things. One is the data's got to be accurate, so you can't have any problems with that. And two, it's got to be easy enough so the athletes actually do it. Because all the information you can download from your watch, from all the technology and all the personal performance gear that you can have, that has limitations. And what really needs to happen is an athlete needs to give you feedback. They have to tell you how their training went. They have to tell you how they're feeling. They have to give you insight into what each individual is doing before you can understand what their, what their issues are. And so, you know, if you go back to that concept that you have to individualize every program, now once you start seeing those trends and you start seeing some slippage in sleep, you start seeing some problems with nutrition, you start seeing some problems with how people are feeling, and you combine that with training loads and an understanding of what their physiology is doing, you can really understand, you can see when you might run into problems. If you go back to a 100% healthy team, this is a way to get it done. So that's, that's a, a, a pretty important piece of technology. Now, the shortcoming on it is, is that we are, it's, a, it's not off the shelf. And I'm telling you, most of the stuff we try to do is off the shelf because ultimately I don't have the money or the time or the expertise to develop it. But this one, there wasn't anything to take off the shelf, so now we, we, uh, we had to do the monitoring here. Let's go to the next one. So then the next one we really want to say is, okay, we haven't done very well in the long jump. And we, we, we really need to understand why we're not doing well. We need to be able to give instantaneous feedback to the athletes. So we developed a, a, a system where we could essentially measure velocity, arc of takeoff, um, distance, and shoot video all at the same time, and then give that back to the athletes instantaneously. And we did this down at Chula Vista at the, at the training center down there. And what, you know, it may seem kind of simplistic, but I'm telling you, some of this stuff is fairly simple. It's just a matter of how you put it together and how you make it applicable. Everybody shoots video. If you want to know the one thing that every, every team does, everybody shoots video. But what you do with it is, is the magic. A lot of people shoot video, they go back, they analyze it, they run it through, and then you know, three hours later, you look at it with the athlete. And I'm telling you, after three hours, it loses some of its magic. In this particular case, you can measure these variables, shoot the video, and give it to them instantaneously when they walk back. They basically go, they jump, they come back, and they can see exactly what they did. The outcome is a lot better because they know how they felt and they still feel it. And they can see exactly what they did through the video and what the outcome was in terms of the, of the data. So this is, again, I mean, it's, it's one of the things that probably should have been done 20 years ago, but nobody's done it. But the application of it really makes a difference to the athletes so that they can, they can move forward. So virtual reality, if, uh, if you had to ask me what I think is going to be a game changer for athletes in the future, it's going to be virtual reality. And in the case of virtual reality, you can do a lot of things um, both on the sports psychology stand standpoint, but also protecting the health and, and wellness of the athlete. So I'll use one of my old sports, which is downhill racing. You guys maybe have seen downhill racing at the Winter Games, uh, where you alpine skiing, 
60 to 100 kilometers an hour, basically down a solid ice slope, very fast, very action-packed, super prone to injuries, really difficult. And as a downhill racer, you can't take that many runs. It's just too hard on you. Plus, it's too hard to actually maintain the course. A lot of times, these courses will be two miles long down, in the, in, down an entire mountain. And the ability to maintain that and allow people to take multiple runs is really, really difficult. So one of the things we've done now is we've basically set up 3D cameras and started to record people's downhill runs so that essentially they could be converted into virtual reality into 3D. And the athlete can watch that run over and over and over again so that they understand the slope. Because what happens is in downhill, you know, you know, the terrain changes, the snow changes, the placement of the gates is really important. How you go off of jumps. So sometimes they'll go off of jumps and they'll fly 70 or 80 feet. Where you land and how you land makes all the difference in terms of how you accelerate. And so the ability to actually see that over and over and over again in your mind is a huge advantage because you're not ripping up your body while you're doing it. And it's actually possible. And so we've been working really closely with the uh, U.S. Ski and Snowboard Association and with three different providers to essentially capture the information, which in the video capture is not easy either. So you've got a two mile course, basically have to use um, some uh, stationary cameras, but then you have to use mobile cameras and you have to use cameras on the athletes. So by you know developing the, the technology to actually do that, to capture it was pretty huge and, and the ability to actually then distill it down and use it again, not three hours later, but in the finish area was critical. And so this is one of the other you know, big tools for us. And you think about it, mountain biking, cycling, there's you know, the sport, the list of sports where virtual reality can become a huge, huge player in the future is, uh, is pretty much unlimited. I was talking to you about kind of the, the long jump, but the same thing applies to discus and shot put, is that ultimately an athlete goes out and does a throw, and they know what they feel and they know how far it went but they don't know the angle of trajectory, the acceleration speed, they don't understand uh, the spin, they don't understand where it went angle-wise in the, in, the, uh, in the venue. And by not having that information, they're somewhat limited. You know, they can kind of see the video, but, but there's a lot more information out there than that. So in, uh, in golf, there was a, there was a uh, radar system developed where when you hit the golf ball, track the golf ball, look at the spin of the golf ball, trajectory, basically track all the motion of the golf ball. So we went to that company and said, you know what, we'd actually like to develop a similar type of uh, project with you. But we want to use it for shot putting and discus. And you know, a golf ball is that big and goes really fast, and a shot put, as you all know, is heavy, slow, it's got a completely different kind of mass. And so we had to really modify their software to do this. But again, through this partnership, we paid them a little bit of money, they came back and said, okay, I can give you the video and all the data around every single throw instantaneously. So that our athletes essentially would go out, they throw, they come over and take a look at the throw, and right when they knew what they felt, they could see what the outcomes were and why. And the why was so important because the coach and the athlete would sit there together and go, you know why you didn't go far enough? Because your angle was too high, it wasn't flat enough. Your spin, your spin rate was too low. You need a spin factor. You need to be closer. And there are all sorts of variables that can be measured. And each time you measure them, and each time you change them, you learned a little bit about what was the best setup for each athlete. And what it what it resulted in is a, uh, you know, I think at the World Championships in 2015, uh, at the we had like world records going into the into the championships from the trials, and nobody medaled. And that was for two reasons. One is, is that we weren't coaching them well. And two is, is that the time between the trials and the time between the Olympic Games was too long and they were going out and actually getting professional events. And so what happened was they peaked for the trials. Then instead of coming down and then trying to peak again for the, for the Olympics, just, or for the World Championships, they just stayed kind of flat here and then never hit their World Championship record, uh, personal bests and, and World Championship records. So by taking the data, on their training and taking the data on how they threw and combining it, we went to seven medals in Rio. 
meaning, and I'll, uh, let me see if that, I think the next video here, let's, uh, let's go to the next slide there. This is a little bit about the, the information, so that kind of, that's the display. This went along with the, uh, with the video, so the video's right in here. Essentially, you could look at where in the field you were throwing, track every single throw, track speed, angle, distance, release height, and direction, so that ultimately all those variables could be, could be tracked, and you could look at, when I did certain things certain ways, you know, you could aggregate the data, I got my best throws. So that's what you're always looking for. So one of the things I wanted to talk a little bit about is that we are all inundated by technology, and I'm really inundated by technology. I can tell you it does, a day doesn't go by when somebody doesn't try to sell me something. And there are so many different types of technology out there and so many different applications for it that it can be really confusing for the athletes. And one of the things that uh, we have worked hard on and I would encourage you know everybody to think about is technology for technology's sake is not it doesn't work technology because it has a specific purpose and you can apply it in a specific way to help someone is what makes the difference but the only way you can do that is to make sure that it's accurate that it's effective that you can communicate it well and that ultimately it doesn't become a distraction um, one of the one of the things that I think has become a bit of a problem is uh, I remember in, uh, in the Winter Olympic Games in 2006, about five days before the, the competition, one of the ski companies introduced a bunch of new skis. So the skis have different stiffnesses, they're shaped differently, they have, you know, they have very different characteristics. But suddenly, you know, these athletes are faced with a choice, do I use the new skis or do I use the skis that I've got to the Olympics on? Man, you don't want to try to put those kind of decisions in front of the athletes at that point in their career. God, I always remind them that, you know, you got here through some, the fundamentals. Because the fundamentals have not changed that much. Hard work, smart work, consistency, you know, being a champion in your mind, being a champion physically, you know, being willing to put yourself out there and to actually go the extra mile to be a champion. Technology can't replace that. And so one of our jobs is to actually figure out how do you blend this amazing technology world, you know, the Internet of Things, how do you take that and use it in su such a way that you can be effective? And I think that uh, it's, a, it's one of the biggest challenges I have. I mean, right now we're collecting so much data, I can't even tell you. And people ask me, like, why are you collecting all this? I'm like, well, if we don't collect it, we'll never have it. I don't really know what we're going to do with it, and I promise you I'm not going to apply it until I know what to do with it. But I got But we. But if you don't have the data and you don't have it stored away, you don't have it in, a, in you know some some form somewhere, somewhere down the road, you might miss it. So as much as I'm not pulling that out of the suitcase and handing it to the athletes, I'm not saying you shouldn't have it. I'm not saying saying you shouldn't test it. I'm not saying that you shouldn't do everything you can to be as educated and as smart about all technology. But the but the key is is that how you use it. So one of the things that you know, I was kind of fin finish up with, you know, we have the, the Winter Olympic Games in uh, Pyeongchang, South Korea coming up here and uh, starting on February 9th and the Paralympic Games uh, uh, starting in uh, March 8th right after that. And as we're going into those games, technology plays a big role in winter sport. And some of the things you have to think about is, so, um, how do you design a bobsled? So bobsled competitions are, are won and lost by hundreds of a second. And when you think about the technology, first of all, you have the push athletes, so you've got to have really good push athletes, and you've got to have really good drivers. But you can't have a crappy sled. You've got to have a great sled. So one of the things we've been really looking at, and we've worked with BMW, we've worked with some of the um, professional race teams out of NASCAR, um, we're now working with a group, a consortium, is to essentially to figure out how do you make a faster sled? How do you make it so that the, using fluid dynamics, looking at runner hardness, looking at the way the chassis is built, looking at the way the steering is set up, how do you build a better sled? So that when you do have the best push athletes and you're the best driver, you also have the best sled. Same thing in like luge. So, you know, there's skeleton and there's luge. Luge, one of the things is uh, the Germans are really good at it. They win half the medals all the time. But one of the reasons they win half the medals is they got really fast sleds. How do they have fast sleds? Because the steel they use is really, um, designed the right way. The composition of the steel 
and the way that it interacts with the snow makes a huge difference. So we're looking at that as an option. How many of you know what biathlon is? Anybody? All right, shooting and cross-country skiing. Basically, you go out and you ski as hard as you possibly can, get your heart rate up to you know, 180, 190. You come into a range, you cross-country ski into a range, you have to bring your heart rate down, and you have to shoot targets that are that big that are 50 meters away. <laughs> How do you do that? Part of the technology there is you have to design the guns properly. So one of the things that's uh, interesting is the ammunition and the, the uh, steel that's used in the barrel has to be able to adapt to cold temperatures. So your normal rifles, they're just 22s. They're just small bore rifles. But they have to be a, the right kind of steel and the right kind of ammunition so that when it's 16 degrees Fahrenheit, they don't contract and you don't get misfires and you don't actually miss the target. Huge issue there. Collecting information on the athletes and their recovery and how they basically bring themselves down from 185 to 70, to 80. How do you bring your heart rate down? How do you do it in the 75 meters between when you enter the stadium to when you're in position to shoot? And how do you do it effectively? Huge challenge, but one of the great things that you can actually measure. I mean, we can measure how people are doing it, how effective it is, and then we can look at the outcomes. So, you know, coming into the winter games, we got a lot of really interesting technology challenges. Uh, the final one is actually, a, you know, people probably don't think about this one, but, you know, I was talking about either downhill or downhill racing or speed skating. The suit makes a huge difference because drag basically can either, you know, slow you down or speed you up. So where you place the seams on the suit makes a big difference. If you have the seams in the wrong place, the air flows over you, and it basically creates a vacuum behind you. And you can measure the vacuum. If you have the seams in the right place, it breaks the vacuum and speeds you up. I uh, remember in uh, Nagano in the, in the, the uh, Olympic Games in 1998, one of the athletes I worked with won uh, a silver medal by two hundredths of a second. And you think about that, you know, he was in the Super G, so it was about a minute, you know, a little over a minute long in the, the run. And, and it, in a minute, two hundredths of a second, the suit makes a difference. So we're now out helping design suits and figure out the best way to make sure that our suits are the fastest they can be. So there's a lot of uh, let's see there. There's a lot of uh, interesting ways to use technology. Um, what I kind of want to finish with is is this notion that in our world, you know, and in the sporting world, I think there is going to be this just explosion of ideas around technology. But at the same time, I'm really going to focus on making sure we're doing the fundamentals well. You know, so as an example, how many people eat right? How many people eat right for when you're training versus when you're competing as a wrestler? How many people get enough sleep? How many people, you know, do meditation or put their mind in a good place? You have to do the fundamentals well. And you can measure them, but if you don't do those well, all the technology in the world won't get you there. <laughs>